Okay. Let's take a screenshot, though. This is so cute. <laughs> I we never thought that. about that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Patricia. Welcome to the 55th episode of A Breath of Song. I am so glad you chose to do this today, which is extra special because Katie Ty Warren is joining us for a songwriter conversation. Hi, Katie. Welcome. Hi. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Author and songwriter Charlotte Erickson said, When I discovered music, when I discovered the craft of shaping a song, my being fell into place. We are here to let our beings fall into place, one song at a time. Your voice is exactly what's needed for this. I'm coming to you straight from my home in what is now called Burlington, Vermont, on the unceded lands of the Abenaki. And Katie, tell us where you're calling from. I'm on the unceded Ohlone territory that we call Richmond in the Bay Area, California. Great. All of our voices will turn up as they are today. No matter what, we can feel the connection to our breath and the vibration in our body. Let's find how good it can feel to sing. Last week, I shared Katie's song, Surrender. Today, Katie will be teaching us a beautiful, brand new song of hers called Everything is Changing. We'll learn it slowly so it can settle inside you and you can begin to trust it as a resource. Let it move you into a state of flow. Then we get to enjoy a conversation with Katie and we'll close out with the song again at the end. So let's start with a good yawn stretch. Oh, oh, maybe roll your shoulders a bit. Mm, feel into your back, your thighs, your feet. Wherever in your body is calling you to pay attention. Hmm. And noticing your breath as it comes in. And heads out. How it feels in your mouth and your face. And noticing next time it comes in, how it can widen your rib cage. And as it goes out, letting it release something. And as it comes in, stretching into your belly, pushing down into your pelvic floor, and letting it release. And one more, feeling into your back, widening either side of your spine, and releasing. And on the next breath, let's try just sighs. And another one. One more, making faces as you do it. I'm going to turn it over to you to share the song. All right. I love when other people warm me up. Thank you for warming me up. Mm. <laughs> um, can I talk about the song before I sing it? Maybe just a smidge, but just really. Just a little bit? Yeah. Okay. I actually don't think this song needs a lot of talking because it kind of applies to everything nowadays. So I'll just, um, I'll just say that. I'll say it's really applicable, <laughs> at least in my experience of the world right now. I'll sing it all the way through, and then I'll break it down. Everything is changing. Life keeps rearranging. And sometimes it feels awkward. But we cannot go backward. We cannot go backward. That's the whole song. So now you get to sing it back to me. Everything is changing. Your turn. Everything is changing. Life keeps rearranging. Life keeps rearranging. And sometimes it feels awkward. And sometimes, sometimes it feels awkward. But we cannot go backward. But we, we cannot, cannot go, go backward. backward. Do that again. 
We cannot go backward. We cannot go backward. Let's put it together. Everything is changing. Life keeps rearranging. Let's do that part. Everything is changing. Life keeps rearranging. And sometimes it feels awkward, but we cannot go backward. We cannot go backward. And sometimes, sometimes it feels awkward, but we cannot go backward. We cannot go backward. Whole thing. Everything is changing. Life keeps rearranging. And sometimes it feels awkward. But we cannot go backward. We cannot go backward. Everything is changing. Life keeps rearranging, and sometimes it feels awkward, but we cannot go backward. We cannot go backward. Everything is So now I'm going to add some harmonies. Life is And I want you to either stay on the melody. And or add your harmonies too. It feels awkward, but we and every time I do this, they come out differently. And I really want to encourage it to be awkward. <laughs> Everything is changing. Life keeps rearranging. And sometimes it feels awkward. But we cannot go backward. We cannot go backward. Everything is changing. Life keeps rearranging. And sometimes it feels awkward. But we cannot go backward. We cannot go backward. Everything is changing. Everything is Life keeps rearranging. Life keeps rearranging. Sometimes it feels Sometimes it feels awkward. We cannot go backward. We cannot go. We cannot go. Sometimes it feels sometimes awkward, it feels awkward. We cannot go but we cannot go we cannot go we cannot go back everything is everything is life keeps real And that's how the song goes in this moment. Yay! Wow! <laughs> that is so satisfying to sing, Katie. Oh Thanks for singing Lord. with me. So satisfying. Oh, good. Yeah. So, yeah, I put 
I put what I sing into the recording so mm -hmm. people can hear me making mistakes and <laughs> screwing it up. And sometimes I play other things, but I just kept singing that melody. And hearing you harmonize it with me was so satisfying. Oh, I'm so glad. And I loved the awkward harmonization on <laughs> awkward. It was so <laughs> fabulous. It was like, ooh, wow, where is that going? That is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> I think the first time that happened, I went, uh-oh, oh, no, wait. No, actually, that's perfect. Let's keep going. <laughs> yeah. This is a new song for you, and you were hesitant to share it. You said to me, ah, it's a new I song. Was, yeah. I don't know what, I know. what it is yet. I, you were so encouraging about it, though. It felt so sweet. Like, this is the perfect, you're the perfect person with the perfect container to hold it. Um, it is a new song, and it's new partly because of the limitations of sharing it this past couple of years. I was trying mm -hmm. to think of when did it like, like on the calendar, when did it come? And it probably was late 2020. My kid was very young. He was born in September 2020. And so it was probably in his first few months that the song came. But I only sang it to him for mm -hmm. a long time. And it wasn't it wasn't all jazzed up. <laughs> it was just me singing it to him as a lullaby. Uh -huh. You know, babies are going through so much change so quickly. And I was going through so much change so quickly. The whole world was going through so much change so quickly. And it just felt like a comfort song, like yeah. very slow and soothing, not like the version you just heard. And um, could you just sing it for us just, yeah. just once through in the yeah, lullaby let me, version? Let me put myself in that yeah. place. <laughs> I'm all excited to be on the podcast. I have to, like, calm myself down for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> mm. Everything is changing. Life keeps rearranging. And sometimes it feels awkward. But we cannot go backwards. We cannot go backward. Mm. And I would just rock him. I would take him on walks yeah. to try to get him to sleep. Yeah. And I'd be carrying him on my body, rocking him and singing that into his little ears. I love the way songs can change. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and can, can carry so, much, so many different feelings. Definitely. Definitely. And, and you and I talked about this a little bit of like, at least for me, growing up with recorded music or music that's, you know, written on paper, sheet music, or, you know, I was I was classically trained. And so I had all these uh, instructions that things were supposed to go a certain way. You're supposed to do this grace note here and you're supposed to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I don't know, like change your volume here. Or this intonate, like these little details that this mm -hmm. is the way they do it on the recording. So this is the way the song goes. And um, in more recent years, I've come to embrace a lot more flexibility about how many different ways a song can go. It's different every time. Uh -huh. It's like a breath. I love the breath of song, right? Like it's different yeah. every, every breath is different. Every time you sing a song, it's different. And I think that's part of why I've had a hard time recording some of my music because I want to like decide how it goes before I record it. Mm, yeah. um, and I think that was part of the leap of sharing this in a, in a podcast format where it's going to be recorded and it's going to be shared, I thought, oh, I really want to know how the song goes, like with a capital G. Yeah. And it just wasn't telling me yet, you know? Yeah. And you said, that's okay. Let's, if you want to, let's share it anyway. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we were having this conversation, I was remembering that in high school, when I went to my first big concert in the 80s and it was Don McLean and I was thrilled by then he was kind of I don't want to say passe the poor guy you know but <laughs> he wasn't maybe a huge hit anymore but so he was coming somewhere local to me and it was my first big concert and I wanted to hear American Pie and Starry Starry Night and all of those songs and I wanted them to sound exactly like the recording right you know <laughs> And now when I go to concerts, I'm far more interested in hearing how a song has grown with an artist or how, a, mm -hmm. how an artist changes a song. And I adore covers that don't sound like the original. I heard a version of Crocodile Rock and I was like, oh, that's fabulous. You know, it was just yeah. totally different from what I'd grown up with and the original recording. And I'm curious what you think about the pluses of... The pluses of continuity and familiarity, because they exist too. And 
with my two and a half year old granddaughter, she's like, no, sing it the same way. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I've heard that kids go through that. I'm kind of dreading that. (laughs) And then the pluses of change and fluidity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if I have, I've been thinking about this because you and I were, were talking about it a bit around this song. Um, And I, I feel like I'm just at the beginning of this exploration. Like I don't have it all figured out Uh by any stretch of the imagination. I think that I really enjoy memorizing things. So for me, it's very satisfying to memorize something the way that it goes. And I find a lot of security in knowing how it goes. And as a song leader, if I don't actually really know how it goes, I can't teach it. Mm -hmm. If I only kind of know it, Mm -hmm. it won't work. Um, Mm -hmm. So I have to really know the song inside and out, even if I know that there's room for flexibility in the song. Mm -hmm. Like I could teach this song the way I just did with the melody and then say, and now do what you feel like doing and that will be the song today. And that's okay. For me, because my history was in theater and classical music and Broadway and stuff that was more, um, more sort of training centric and performative, there was Mm -hmm. such a strong emphasis on the way that it goes and there being sort of like a rigidity around that that I actually started to experience that rigidity in my voice as well. And I I actually mm. lost my voice probably at least once a year for the first mm. 20 years of my life. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe not exactly that, but like I was performing from age, I don't know, two or three, just for fun. Mm-hmm. Um, I would seek out little kid shows to do and stuff. And so I was always being told to use my voice a certain way. And I think that that's... That's one of the negatives about it, quote, needing to go a certain way, is you're trying to hit this target that, that happened once and it got written down or yeah. that it, it got recorded in one person's voice. That's not your voice. You have a different voice, but that's not honored when you're trying to, to match that person. So, so yeah, I think, I don't know, security and stability and fun to be had with like knowing how a thing goes and being able to, to share it that way. But for me, it was really, there was like a little bit of a dangerous quality to it to get too absorbed in that. I have a much healthier voice now that I play with the flexibility and allow myself to show up imperfectly. And like this morning I woke up and I was like, oh no, I'm a little phlegmy. Oh man, I have to record this podcast and I'm (laughs) phlegmy and it's not perfect. You know, and I was like, oh wait, this is why I do what I do now instead of what I did then because I want to show up in a world where our whole voices are welcome Mm. and that doesn't look like the crystal clear recording every time that doesn't look like the album that got released with all the polished details you know right it looks like people singing and like bringing their whole bodies so yeah I think my whole body is more welcome in the song if there's flexibility for how the song goes (laughs) wow you just described a breath of song back to me oh good (laughs) I mean it's kind of my the purpose of doing this was was that I have found for myself when I started to, I lost my voice when I sang, um, mm. and I had, it, I had a, a big disconnect with my body, and it took me a long time and a lot of very tender, gentle coaching, to be able to feel my body at the same time as I was singing, mm. and once I started doing that, what I found is that my voice is such a such a way into wellness for me. Yeah. It's it's such a canary. It tells me as soon as the slightest (laughs) thing is not working, you know, I know exactly what you mean. And, and it also is, is such a way to connect with that intuitive part. So I'm wondering, can you tell us about a time when you felt that singing a particular song was connected to your wellness? Because of course this podcast is centered around learning particular songs yeah absolutely well there's been a lot of them (laughs) there's really been a lot of them and one thing that I like to remind myself and my singers of is that you know we are what 70 80 percent water and if you think of what vibration does to water you can see it it changes it right yeah so sometimes the songs have been something like surrender or uh, or my song slow down came to mind when you asked me this question mm-hmm. which the lyrics are literally slow down slow down which is almost never not applicable <laughs> it's always <laughs> a message i need to hear um and it's very medicinal like i need when i sing it i do slow down on a sort of a deep internal level and 
Sometimes there are songs like Hangaiwa, which is a Shona song from Zimbabwe about pigeon doves. And I just love this song. And it's like so healing. And there's something about the vibrations in it. And I don't need to understand intellectually what is happening. Like, like well, maybe pigeon doves are comforting. Like, I, don't, I don't think that's necessarily, that might be what's happening. But I think there's something in those vibrations that my nervous system, the waters in my body might be responding to. So yeah, I'll mention Slow Down a little bit. Um, It's another one of my songs that came through. I was in a, um, it was like a week long intensive workshop with something like 55 other song leaders. And there's this frenzied excitement that starts to happen because everybody's sharing songs and we're staying up all hours singing to each other. And she's like so delicious and like the oxytocin is flowing. (laughs) And I, at some point, maybe on day I don't know, four or five, went home and just like got on my knees in a dark corner of the bedroom I was staying in <laughs> at, at my host's house. And the song dropped in. And it was it's interesting because it's it's made up of layers like Surrender is um, different layers, different become the harmonics of the song. And I could hear certain different song leaders. I could hear their voices in the harmonics that were coming through. And I was like, oh, this is a collective message for like the whole situation. And it's also for me. I need to slow down or I'm going to burn out during this event. And so, you know, I came in the next day and shared it. I don't know if anybody slowed down. We probably didn't. But um, but it was very like, here's some medicine, Katie. Sit here. <laughs> <laughs> Sit here and sing this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know that you are an Ubuntu choir leader. Yeah. And thinking about the Shona song that you talked about coming from, I know that the Ubuntu philosophy also comes from the continent of Africa, different right. place, right? Could you talk a little bit about the the philosophy yeah. and, and how that connects with singing in groups? And Yeah, I would love to. I love talking about this. This is why I'm excited to be part of the Ubuntu Choirs Network. Um so Ubuntu, it's a Bantu word, so it is actually from the same part of the world as, as the Hangaiwa song that I mentioned. And it, it, it describes something that we don't have a word for in English, which I think is very telling of our culture. And a really common translation for it is, I am because we are. And what it's describing is that I do not exist as an island or in a vacuum. I literally am who I am in the world in relation to other people. And and things I do affect you and things you do affect me and you are connected to me and I'm connected to you. And it goes on and on and on. And to live with that in mind is a really different culture than the one that is dominant where I grew up in California, uh-huh. <laughs> um, uh-huh. where it's about, you know, competition and individuality. And, um, and it just is, for me, I, I find that incredibly healing and intuitive. It was like, oh, this is what my body has known all along, but we seem to have forgotten it. Um, The founders of the Ubuntu Choirs Network are white Canadian folk who were teaching music from all over the world and were really struggling to find a word that described what they felt they were doing in their choir. Like I mentioned, we don't have an equivalent word in English. (laughs) And they were looking, you know, in a lot of different languages languages that were closer to their own heritage, and they just couldn't find anything, but they kept coming back to the word Ubuntu and feeling like, oh, gosh, we can't use this word. <laughs> this is not from our culture. I don't know if it's okay. It is It is from a culture that has a lot of community singing woven into the fabric of the culture, which is also telling. Anyway, eventually what they decided to do was to reach out to Archbishop Desmond Tutu and to write to him and say, this is what we're doing. It feels like the word Ubuntu describes what we're doing. What do you think of us using the word, even though we're so far outside of the culture that this word originated in? And Tutu wrote back and said that he completely understood the relationship here. And I'm I'm going to paraphrase that it. it's not going to be perfect, but Something along the lines of uh, echoing back that I am a person in relation to you as a person, and a choir is a choir because of its parts, because of its people, and the different people singing the different parts harmoniously. The harmonies make up the song. We are all part of the song. And he says, God bless you in your noble endeavor. And I'm grateful that I learned about the Ubuntu philosophy through this work of community singing and through the Ubuntu Choirs Network, directly how I came into it. Um, The song that you taught uh, last week, Surrender, is a layer song, meaning that it is 
made up of layers. Each one is a melody. You can have each layer by itself. You put it together, it makes the whole song. And so when I teach, we're usually standing in a circle and I'm, I'm saying you can pick whichever part you want to sing. You don't have to pick the part I assigned to you. You can pick the part that feels right in your body because your voice is welcome and valid here in whatever form it's in. You know? um, and so if you're if you're somebody who has a really low voice, but you really feel good singing that high part, go ahead and sing the high part. But the song is greater than the sum of its parts. And the song is the whole song, because each and every individual voice is in it. And we're not singing so loudly that we can't hear each other. We're also holding our own melody or harmony as we're listening to others. I think this is a really crucial part of practicing Ubuntu is that it's not uniformity. We're, all, we're not all singing in unison. We're singing our own parts, which might be different from somebody else's part, but we're singing it together and it's making something new. And when we bring all of us together into that, then the whole song is created. And that's, for me, that's like a template <laughs> for what I want to do in the world in general. But we can start by doing it via a, a collective musical experience by having these, um, these moments in choir together. So I'm going to ask you an awkward question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because... Because when I started choral directing, one of the things that would happen is people will come up to you and say, so-and-so is not listening. Mm -hmm. So-and-so is, or so-and-so is singing out of tune and I can't sing my part because mm -hmm. they're singing out of tune and it's distracting <laughs> me. And yeah. so, so what you've just described is a very idyllic, wonderful vision mm -hmm. of singing in community, right? And I can imagine somebody <laughs> listening to this who hasn't sung in community for the past couple of years and thinking, yeah, well, it's also kind of obnoxious when the person <laughs> next to me is yeah. not singing the right notes, you know, or is really loud. And they can't, I know they're not listening to me. They are, they can't possibly hear me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm curious. And I, I think this is something that song leaders run into all of the time, right? And, yeah, we do. <laughs> and, and choir participants run into. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? Both, how do you deal with it as a song leader? And then also, how do you deal with it when you're a person in a group? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are such good questions. And yeah, awkward. But that's okay. We can deal with awkward. So it's been a while since I've taught in person. So let me think back to how it went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it might be different. I mean, one of the things that might happen is that we might... So we might be listening in new ways. I would hope so. I think. I would hope so. Um, so in my previous experience, in the before time, I did a lot of listening exercises with my group. Mm -hmm. There were a few things that we did. Right from the get-go, I would hold orientation moments <laughs> along the way mm -hmm. to reorient ourselves. Um, including instructions to not comment on each other's voices. If you feel like there's a couple different things happening in your one section over here, I want you to raise your hand and say, I'm hearing a couple different things. I'm not sure what's happening. Or I think maybe our section needs to hear our part again, but not singling people out for good or bad. So basically, I have a rule in my choir that you're not supposed to say things like, I, I love your voice. I, you have such a great voice. I don't want people to... Um, to be singling each other out that way either because you don't know the history of somebody's voice or what their mm -hmm. relationship is to it. And it also, somebody in my choir actually brought this to my attention that there's some research around favoritism being related to shame. That if some if mm -hmm. some people are being favorited, that there is this automatic, you know, other side of that seesaw, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that like other people might be experiencing shame. So just to kind of level the playing field that like, we're not quite in cohesion here. Can you please tighten it up for us? And, and to direct that question to me as the leader rather than to try to fix each other's parts, mm -hmm. which is what happens. People turn to each other and try to correct each other. And I said, please don't do that. Just ask me to come over. So that's one thing is just not to comment to each other directly. Comments like, I love singing with you. Are welcome. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> you know, you're a lot of fun to sing with, um, but not to comment on each other's voice or whether they're getting it right or wrong. And then some people are really confident. And so I would um, not just confident, but also accurate with their notes. And um, to name who those people are in a, a loving way, like these are our anchors for this part. So and so is going to be our anchor. So if you're not sure how it goes, I want you to really listen, listen extra to this person right now and see if you can blend your voice with theirs. 
And usually those anchors are people I've talked to outside of rehearsal already to mm. kind of establish that relationship. Mm -hmm. We've had people who came in pretty much unable to hold the pitch on their own and then became anchors over time because mm -hmm. they got so much more confident. And then the listening exercises would usually consist of some version of getting much closer together than we can nowadays and singing perhaps all on one note and just hearing hearing what it's like to blend because it's a different feeling in your body again the vibrations mm -hmm. physically on your mm -hmm. body if you're not used to blending it can actually feel kind of alarming for some people some mm -hmm. people think their voice disappears and then they go off pitch trying to find their voice you know mm -hmm. yeah and it's actually a sign that you're blending <laughs> if your voice has disappeared yeah. and and for me it's a delicious feeling but for some people it's really new and it's kind of scary so I would sometimes just hold one note listen and I would say Let's turn turn the, the knobs and turn the dials and listen 90% to other people and only 10% to yourself. And you'd hear everybody get really quiet. So they're mostly listening and then turn the dials the other way. So you're mostly listening to yourself and not really to the people who go really loud and they're kind of off pitch sometimes. <laughs> and, and we kind of, you know, I found that's usually around like listening around 70% to other people is usually yeah. like a good way to do it. But, um, but also the journey of trying to modulate your listening is a yeah. really nice nice strengthening exercise and then to do it with two notes to do a harmony and then maybe three note a three note harmony and make a chord and keep holding that and and just kind of get people's bodies comfortable with it because we didn't a lot of us didn't grow up in a culture where we were singing with other people so why would our bodies be used to it it's yeah. like a physical activity and we act like it's an innate talent but if we acted that way about I don't know, riding a bicycle or something, it would be crazy to be like, oh, well, I just I just can't ride bicycles. Like, it was hopeless, right? You'd say, no, you can learn, right? You have to right. learn the balance and then learn the speed and like, you'll get the hang of it and keep trying. But we don't talk about singing that way. So I just try to make it a space where you can let your body get used to it over time. Nice. Um, and I say if you're if you can't hear the people around you, you're singing too loud, <laughs> just like uh -huh. as a rule of thumb. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I, it's, it can definitely be awkward sometimes, though. Yeah. Yeah. And how about for yourself when you are in a large group? Mm hmm I move. Mm hmm Yeah, if I yeah. need to move my body somewhere, I will. Yeah. Yeah. So if I'm ever standing next to you and you move away, I now know. <laughs> necessarily. <laughs> I'm a very fidgety person. Sometimes I move just because I want to sort of fly around the room and hear all the parts, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah. yeah, sometimes I want to go sit with my friend. I often end up in the bass section. I like the bass parts. I usually. love the bass section. Yeah. That's one of my favorite places to be. <laughs> okay, good. You and I can sing there together. Yeah. Okay. I think it's also really important to mention how this interacts with COVID. Mm. Um, so I, I really encourage my choir members to think about Ubuntu and to practice Ubuntu and to live Ubuntu to the best of their ability in their everyday life, knowing that we are in a culture that directly does not set us up for it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the COVID pandemic really, it really changed our ability to relate to Ubuntu. The, the act of forced isolation directly, mm -hmm. first of all, mm -hmm. went against our being able to be collaborative and uh, interact the way that we're accustomed to or to practice that interaction. Um, but it forced us to really think about how we affect each other. Mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of the pandemic, when we first went into lockdown, and there was a lot of talk about protecting each other and about knowing that some people are at higher risk than others, and we're not exactly sure how it's spreading. And so to be on the safe side, we're all going to collectively work to stop this virus. Mm -hmm. Although that was an incredibly tragic and scary time, I rejoiced to be hearing that talked about at such a big cultural level. And I mm -hmm. thought, gosh, this is the first time that we're actually noticing on a global scale and on our, our country's scale, so our country's very sort of self-centric a lot of the time, um, to notice that we are in fact interconnected and that what I do affects you and what you do affects me. This is Ubuntu. <laughs> How great that we're finally talking about mm. it. You know, and then like six months later, everybody was kind of <laughs> wanting to go back to doing their own thing. And now I find myself frustrated a lot at the individual choices that are being made more and more and more without regard for the collective experience right. of 
trying to eradicate this virus that now is apparently here to stay. So um, when I I'm in the process of trying to reopen my choir in a way that feels very COVID cautious, because I want it to be a place that is welcoming of people who don't really feel comfortable with this kind of mask optional, if you feel okay with the risk, you can go ahead and live your life. But if you don't, then you have to continue staying home kind of attitude that we've Mm -hmm. adopted. That is very not Ubuntu to me. Mm -hmm. And so for me in building my choir and the culture of my choir in the spirit of Ubuntu, I say to people, if you're coming to this choir, I need you to be on board with the idea of really keeping each other in mind. We have been apart for two years plus at this point. We've all had really intense experiences during that time. Everybody has maybe a different comfort level at this point. Everybody probably has a little more trauma or a lot more trauma under their belts. And Mm -hmm. um, our re-entry into uh, in-person community is not going to feel the same for everybody. So I have a lot of precautions, I guess you could call them, that are in place partly for COVID safety because singing together is a very high risk activity. And so it makes me nervous having a little one who's too young even to mask if I wanted him to, let alone get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like the emotional safety is really important that there's a wonderful saying about how you can't force a flower to bloom by tearing it open. And I think Mm -hmm. that oftentimes when something that wasn't offered for years is now offered again, or, you know, the bars reopen, or people are having weddings again, or whatever, there's this temptation to rip the flower open and just like, go be a flower again, the way it was before, and, Mm. you know, be wide open. And, you know, we've really been through a lot. So to allow ourselves to bloom in a safe pace, in a safe place for Mm. ourselves, in a safe way, and in community to begin to bloom and cry and grieve and and get to know each other and hug when it Mm -hmm. feels safe and wave when it doesn't feel safe to hug and to to re-enter into um, not a uniform experience, but Mm -hmm. a collective one where we all have our individual stories, um, but we can still enter into the songs together. And so that's been a big mental slog, I guess. <laughs> There's been a lot to think about in terms of how do we get there. And um, in addition to certain COVID safety precautions, we're also using something called the bird cat dog method of communicating our comfort with being approached by others physically. Um, Everything's outdoors and um, there's other precautions in place as well. But in addition to that, just the emotional safety of not knowing if somebody's going to come up and try to hug you, for me, it puts me on guard. So, mm-hmm. So thinking about that, uh, you know, Ubuntu as a way of keeping each other safely held in a communal container so that we can have this experience together. When the container is really high stakes, because we've been through a global medical crisis together, and we're still in it. That has been a really interesting mind, uh, (laughs) mind game, (laughs) mind, mind adventure, and something that I'm starting to explore with my choir. And and so far, that feels... um, I don't know, difficult, but like really, really nourishing too. So how do you take care of yourself aside from singing? How do you make choices? You are a mother of a young child. Yeah. So time, energy, it's all limited. It's really limited. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Well, I, uh, this is a thing I'm exploring. I think probably all new parents are exploring it. And I would bet anybody who has lived the last couple of years is probably exploring Mm -hmm. it too. Um, I haven't had as much access to singing as I am used to. It's actually been quite hard on my spirit to not uh, feel like I could access this thing that brings me so much Mm -hmm. joy and stability and breath, honestly. Like um, physically, I feel different for not having sung as much the last couple of years. Um, So I, I really, I live with some chronic conditions, which flare if I don't sort of do regular physical stuff. Like I think I mentioned to you, I have just come from acupuncture earlier today and that's something I try to do weekly and breathing (laughs) I try to breathe um I think I really do a lot I sort of take this for granted because it's become such a habit but I really do a lot of monitoring of my own mental health and my own sort of inner thought pattern if I start trending toward the negative or obsessing about the negative, or if I'm rushing, Uh. rushing is a big clue for me. There's a lot of clues that it's time to 
to uh, to do something, uh-huh. <laughs> do something uh-huh. else, do something else besides continue to ruminate, because I think there's a lot of physical shoulds. Like I'm 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 in physical therapy and I should be getting osteopathy and I, you know, there's these medications I'm supposed to take and there's a lot of that kind of maintenance stuff and none of it brings me joy. Uh-huh. The acupuncture is nice, but the rest of it is kind of a slog. Um, um, You know, and and between that and taking care of a little one and then trying to return to some form of connecting with singing, that's it. That's like my whole day. And so just kind of monitoring, like, am I thinking thoughts of gratitude or am I am I like feeling really upset about something in my head? I'm remembering that we can't swear on this podcast um thanks to apple i think we could probably I, I somehow do not think apple is paying close attention to my podcast not. so i think you can swear but. <laughs> but in general if i'm swearing a lot that's a good clue that maybe i need a minute i might need some water you know and um and then you know a lot of songs including some of the ones that i write are mantra songs so they're just a little a little short message that's good to kind of have in your back pocket and actually sometimes the songs will come rescue me they'll pop into my head Mm. and I'll be like why am I singing this song and then it turns out that it's exactly the message I needed to hear but I wasn't paying attention (laughs) um so that's a lot of it right now I think I am really I think I'm a little short on some of the self-care like being close to friends and that's for obvious pandemic related reasons I think friendships and travel being in community and singing in groups are some of my absolute go-tos and none of them are available really <laughs> the way they used to, to be. Yeah. So, so that's some of it. And trying to eat well. I'm really lucky because I get to see videos and pictures of you and your son periodically. And yeah. there's a beautiful one that I remember where he's leading a group of adults, a group of your friends, <laughs> in a song that he has created. And mm-hmm. I'm wondering how... How has living with a growing human being affected your relationship with your own voice or songs and your own Mm -hmm. song creation? And I know it's got to be hard to tease apart from the pandemic itself. Totally. Directly overlaps, right? But give it a shot. And also, just sidebar, that carrying a baby really changed my physicality. It changed all the muscles I use for my voice. And so now on the other side of it, and after multiple years of singing into a microphone on a computer instead of moving my body out in the world with real people, my voice feels very, very different than it did before. That's part of this change thing, right? Our bodies change. It doesn't matter whether it's from a birth or something else. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's why I decided to open my mouth and share it because a lot of people have been through some kind of physical change. And COVID itself is a voice effector, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It was the first symptom Mm -hmm. for me when I got COVID. And I still don't have the same lung capacity as I did before. I can hear it. I can hear it when I sing. Um, So, yeah, all those changes. What was your question again? (laughs) (laughs) My question was about your son. Yeah. About watching a growing human being and his relationship with his voice. How is that changing your relationship? It's really reinforcing my commitment to do what I want to do with my voice, um, to Mm. do these things with my voice. I um, am watching him from a very early age get very playful with his voice and sing and uh, do silly little voices and do, you know, sirens and, and yeah, just make silly noises and have fun. I, I'm remembering that that's, you know, something we all innately have access to until we unlearn it, or we learn these other sort of more constricting habits. And it's, this is the kind of stuff I used to teach, you know, I used to teach this stuff for people with Parkinson's specifically, because the automatic functions break down with Parkinson's and they lose a lot of things that contribute to clear communication, like facial expression, or tone of voice or inflection starts to go away with Parkinson's Mm -hmm. sometimes. And so I would teach them the breakdown, like if you want me to know that you're happy to see me, what does that what does that need to look like? How does it need to sound? What kind of intonation should it have? And and also you need to be loud enough that I can hear you. So I know you're talking to me. So I would teach them the stuff that now I'm watching my baby learn automatically and just develop in his in his own body. I think it's almost universal that we we learn vocal habits from the people who raise us and who we hear on TV and stuff. And so to undo that requires play. Mm. 
to, to just watch him play and to want him to be able to continue to do that. I need to continue to do that. And he reminds me to keep doing that. <laughs> so there's a lot of vocal play in my house. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Listening to how you were describing what you're doing with the Parkinson's and with and what you're observing in your son, and I'm thinking mm-hmm. about the connections to theater and I'm and communication and mm-hmm. and visual arts and how do you show things, how do you communicate things? And you have this wide, rich background in theater and visual arts and yoga and How do these things interact? How do they feed each other? They really do all interact. (laughs) I felt like when I started song leading in this style, this is the only kind of song leading I've ever done, but when I sort of found this style and then started song leading, I had this feeling like, oh, this is why I trained to be a yoga teacher. Oh, this is why I studied American Sign Language. Oh, this is why... Uh, you know, there was all these random things that didn't seem linked together. This is why I'm an anatomy nerd. Oh, this is why I've always been good at harmonies. Oh, you know, like all this stuff kind of came together. Yeah. It was like, oh, this combination of skill sets is perfect for this exact activity. Um, and, you know, like the all, the yoga thing is a good example because the way I was trained was to do this routine, which I can't teach because it's hot yoga and it affects the chronic condition that I live with. So now I like I learned how to teach this yoga that I can't do. Um, And so I (laughs) as soon as I got my certificate, I went off and I I sort of started modifying it and playing within the framework that I had learned. And it taught me to think on my feet to have a structure and then to be flexible within that structure, and to be able to communicate the directions Mm. that I want my students to be taking like almost as I'm thinking through them, you know, like think it and say it and think it and say it. Mm -hmm. And, um, Mm -hmm. and to let that Mm -hmm. be something that is clearly communicated (laughs) in the moment, while I'm thinking about it, and I'm in my body and I'm participating. And I can also like keep track of time and keep track of where we are in the flow. Does the energy need to come up now? Do we need a rest now? What's happening? You know, so there's this thing that I learned that I don't really use anymore in that form. You know, I don't even go to that yoga studio anymore, but uh, it directly informed me how to put together sort of the flow of an evening for a choir or for a Parkinson's class or something that has flexibility and play within it, but sticks to something that's familiar enough that it feels like we're doing um, something that's building on itself every week. So so that's one example of how it interacts. (laughs) Oh, I love that. I love the I love the thinking about structure and shape and flexibility within structure mm. and about the pacing. Yeah, I'm just I'm I'm sorry. Long cuz it's going to be this long silence on this podcast <laughs> as Patricia kind of lets this soak in. You could do some of your wonderful little uh, song stuff in the background and just let us vibe out with you. <laughs> Yeah. There's just one question that's left on my list that mm. I really, that doesn't really fit right now, but I really <laughs> don't want to miss asking it. All right. What is the earliest song memory that you have? Oh, yeah. That's such a cute question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually don't know about the earliest song, specifically a song memory. I know that um, the first song that I wrote down on paper, I was probably three or four and it's called La La Lu and it has the names of the notes but no information about <laughs> how long to hold the notes or anything like that. Um, well, why would you were three or four? I know. So, <laughs> There's no recording of it. Did you grow up in a household of singers? No, I really, really didn't. Actually, this this really informed my journey about musical. I think I've always been very musical and my parents, I think, are naturally musical but both of them, in my experience, and if you guys are listening, hi, I love you, that they have, they were both really silenced in their own ways. And so by the time I came yeah. along, they had a lot of like, oh, that's not for me. I'm not sure I can participate in that. My father plays the flute. And he put the letters of the notes on the piano. We had a piano at our house. And so I would sit there and plunk out familiar things or I guess make things up like La La Lu. And I remember, this is one of my earliest musical memories, is asking him, I remember trying to pick out, I could pick out things like the theme song to Sesame Street, no problem. 
but I could not pick out the cadence of the conversation I was hearing. And I couldn't figure out why, because I could hear the musicality in the way people talk, but I couldn't find those notes on the piano. And I had been told, these are all the notes. And I was so right. confused. These are clearly not all the notes. So I remember asking him, why, why can't I find these notes? It feels like they're in between here. And like this, this part's sliding, and I don't know how to slide on the piano. And I remember him chuckling. He actually plays Eastern music. He plays the Japanese flute and, and is like a student of Indian music. And so he immediately recognized what I was talking about and said, yeah, you're, you're right. Th those are notes and they just don't exist on this Western instrument. <laughs> That's what's happening. <laughs> Needed so. to get you a stringed instrument. Yeah, exactly. And then, right. And then yeah. I got a violin when I was like four or five. So, <laughs> okay. yeah, but, um, I just, I could hear it. My grandma tells me that once I was out with her and I heard a car horn and I said, oh, that's an A. And so she, she had been a pianist and she was like, I think you probably had perfect pitch. I don't now for sure. Like just FYI, <laughs> I definitely either outgrew it or maybe had, maybe I have some, uh, you know, relational pitch or something like that. But, um, but I, I think I just was very instinctually, maybe genetically musical and mm. was, born into a family where like, like, I, I don't, I don't know, that's not really what we do. Like, we like music, but we don't do music. Um, uh -huh. And I was trying to figure out how to do music. And I really wanted to do music with people. Like, I wanted, I didn't yeah. want to like sit and watch it. I wanted to be in it. Yeah, my understanding of perfect pitch is that it, it's a memory. Mm. It's a form of memory. Oh, interesting. And so you could probably develop it again if you chose to. Well, with my enjoyment of memorization, that may have been what was happening back then. Mm -hmm. I liked memorizing things. So if you had a song that you always sang that started on a G. Well, that I do. I can uh, usually but, pull a note out of it. And not, you know, like if I'm starting a song, I know really well. I'll usually start it on the right then note. Then you've got that. Well, that's perfect pitch is just huh. that practiced over and over again. No kidding. To where, yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I always learn something every time I talk to you, Patricia. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So is there anything right now that you're excited about that you'd like to share? And this can be anything. It doesn't have to be something you're doing. It can be something somebody else is doing. Just something that's <laughs> exciting you. What is exciting you right now? Your baby. What? I mean, what's? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's always exciting, I think. Um, yeah, I feel, I feel very lucky that I have so much enjoyment with my kid. Gosh, you know, this question is... It's hard for me a little bit. I think that I have gotten so used to tempering excitement because there's been so many disappointments and there's been so much hardship and pivoting and last minute changing of plans and having to miss out on so many things uh, this last couple of years, so many sort of rites of passage and people dying and people being born and people wanting to celebrate or mourn together we can't and so I as you're asking this question I'm like ah, I don't know if I really allow myself to feel excitement all that often anymore about something but it's a fabulous question to think about and on a personal level the first thing that comes to mind is I'm excited this summer about hopefully spending some time at the beach with my kid and my partner um that's where I'm from originally. I, gr I grew up by the beach and it's deep in my family's roots. My great grandmother grew up at the beach and, and my grandmother and my mom. And so it feels really, really sweet to be able to look forward, hopefully, to sharing that with my kid and my partner and just the sensory, the sensoriness of being at the beach with the sand and the ocean air and everything is really uh, healing for me. So I'm looking forward to that, and I'm looking forward to to passing that along, hopefully, as a place of comfort for my for my kid, and um, really enjoying sharing it as a family. And I'm also excited about some things that really don't feel that good. Like I'm really excited about a lot of the social changes that are happening, particularly with regards to Black Lives Matter and becoming more aware with the immense amounts of cultural appropriation that are just rampant in the world of community singing that um, have been vastly overlooked and that our community of community singers are really starting to talk about this at a group level. And it's not comfortable. It's not supposed to be comfortable, but I am excited that it's happening. Um, there's a lot of things like that in the world right now that I am excited about. 
And um, yeah, then I'm excited that hopefully as our kid gets a little older that my partner and I might get to start making more art again. We used to draw a cartoon together and kind of just had to stop in the world of 24 hour a day parenting. I'm excited to see my partner get reconnected with his art too, because that's a big part of him that he hasn't had a chance to enjoy recently. And Heather Houston is going to hold a um, retreat later this summer, which Mm. was planned for two years ago at this point, I think. I was going to teach at it then, (laughs) and it got postponed a year, and I was going to teach at it then. It got postponed another year. (laughs) So now, and she's so sweet about it, because, you know, originally I was going to be pregnant at it, and now I've got an almost two-year-old at it, (laughs) and she's, like, making accommodations for me to bring him and my partner, and... And, you know, I'm, I'm nervous about singing up close with a lot of people, but I think, I think she's handling it as safely as anyone can. And, um, I just, I want, I want my kid and I want other people to have access to this kind of environment. So I'm excited about that environment, but I'm holding it really cautiously yeah. because there's been so much yeah. disappointment the last few years, you know? Yeah. That sounds beautiful. Are you ready for a lightning round? Uh, never, but let's do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is just fairly quick answers. I have to ask you a question, though, first. Okay. I know you're going to ask me about soup. Why? I am going to ask Why soup? soup? What's, what's about soup? It, because I love soup. <laughs> <laughs> and because I feel like knowing what kind of soup somebody else loves. I don't know. I mean, it just gives me this sort of window into you beyond music. You know, I feel like I just don't want to ask everything be all about songs. <laughs> so cute. I like, that's tired. so specific. <laughs> I like knowing that you love soup. What's your favorite kind of soup, Patricia? Squash soup. Ooh, that sounds good. Squash apple soup. I shouldn't say. I shouldn't give it away. Oh. <laughs> I should be saving that. Secret soup. I'll save that for the, <laughs> the five-year anniversary <laughs> episode of the podcast. Nice. <laughs> um, you, you, you got it out of me. All right, here we go. <laughs> so I say every time, this is a lightning round. These quick questions, quick answers. It's really interesting to notice which guests... Then follow those directions and give me quick answers. And which guests are like, that's a really interesting <laughs> question. Now let me tell you something. I don't even know which category I'm going to fall into. <laughs> so, no. All right. What's an album that was really important to you? Jagged Little Pill by Alanis Morissette. What is your favorite soup? Um, there's a, a spinach chicken rice something or other that somebody made me when the baby was really little and then I made it and it was his first food. So it's very dear to my heart. See, this question matters. Yeah, I know. I think about it though. (laughs) Just going to say it matters. All right. What is your favorite replacement curse word? Myrna Loy. Myrna Loy? Myrna Loy. Wasn't she an actress? Yeah. Um, a, a mentor of mine used to say Myrna, Myrna, Myrna when she was upset. And it's, I don't actually use it that often, but it is my favorite. <laughs> I love that. I think that is the first name replacement curse word <laughs> I've had. Um, good. What is a, so- a sound that you feel strongly about? And this does not need to be a beautiful sound. It can be. It's just a sound that, that gets you. Sea lions barking. Do you know... Living on the East Coast and having been to California only briefly, I think I've only heard that sound once in my life. Do you remember it, though? Yes. <laughs> I do, actually. <laughs> it's a memorable sound. It is a memorable sound. <laughs> okay. Who is an artist you wish more people listened to? Simon Webb. And we will link to Simon Webb oh, cool. in the show notes. All right. Because you will send me a link. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I hope there's a link out there. <laughs> and before we close, where can we find you and follow your projects and your what you're doing? Oh, yeah. Come to my website where you can click through to all the other things. It's katietywarn.com, but you've got to spell it K-A-I-T-I-E-T-Y-W-A-R-R-E-N. You can get to my choir from there, too, but you can also go straight to thelivingroomchoir.com if you want as well. A huge thank you to you, Katie, for coming on A Breath of Song. You survived. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I knew this was going to be a blast. I was like, I can't believe you asked me. It feels like such an honor. 
A huge thank you to you, our listeners. It is such an honor to us that you are listening. Absolutely. I'm so glad you sing with us. Yay. You're listening. Let me remind you that sharing this podcast with your friends really makes a difference. Visit abreathofsong.com to see show notes with lyrics, links, Patty Petrowski's glorious artwork. Sign up to get artwork and music in your mailbox. And leave something in the tip jar to help cover costs. Before Patty or I is paid, 25% is donated to the Jazz Foundation of America, which directly supports jazz, blues, and roots musicians in need. The skill and the artistry of these musicians has directly shaped most of the music that I share on this podcast, yet historically they have been inadequately recognized and unfairly recompensed by people in power. And this is a small step toward equity that we can take together. Let's sing Everything is Changing Again to help it sink in more deeply. If you're willing, Katie, to lead us. Yeah, I'm going to delete the original recording from earlier this hour. And we're going to do it anew. Perfect, (laughs) because everything is changing. Because everything is always changing, and it can be awkward. It's all right. All right, here we go. Everything is changing. Life keeps rearranging. And sometimes it feels awkward. But we cannot go backward. We cannot go backward. Everything is changing. Life keeps rearranging. And sometimes it feels awkward. But we cannot go backward. We cannot go backward. Everything is changing, life keeps rearranging, and sometimes it feels awkward, but we cannot go backward, we cannot go backward, everything is changing. Life keeps rearranging, and sometimes it feels awkward, but we cannot go backward, we cannot go backward, everything is changing, life keeps rearranging, and sometimes it Awkward in a whole new way. (laughs) Yay for celebrating, shifting, changing awkwardness. Thank you for joining Katie and me today for a breath of song. I'm grateful that you are taking care of yourself and listening to your voice. I believe making a better world starts with tuning into ourselves and each other, which is what we just did. So yay us. If you're liking this podcast, please share with a friend. And next time we'll plant another song. Be well. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> you can pause the recording, stop the All recording. Right. Get to the recording. There we go. Stop.